Major funding for Odyssey was provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Additional funding was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And Polaroid. It's uh, probably the most uh, objective body of data that we have to deal with because people, I don't think, are grinding an axe when they throw the garbage out. Uh, it contains all manner of material which can say quite a bit about the people who threw it out. Archaeologists for a hundred years have been interested in garbage, trash, midden, because what people throw away gives them a great deal of information about what they do, what they eat, how they live, and so on. When you're digging in the streets or whatever, you come on, you know, like old bottles and everything else. So it's, all, it's always a part of that type of construction where you're ex excavating, especially around the city. It has been said that history is the examination of other people's journals, and that archaeology is the investigation of their garbage. Historical archaeology, the archaeology of those people for whom there are written records, uses journals and garbage to explore the recent past. So one sometimes asks, why do it if it's already written down? And the simple fact is that the experience of the vast majority of Americans, for example, has not been thoroughly and adequately documented in the written record. On a California hillside that was once a small city, Jim Dietz is uncovering a 19th century immigrant coal mining town. In the ruins of a Georgia cotton plantation, Charles Fairbanks is finding the remains of slave diet, housing, and daily survival. And in Boston, archaeologists Beth Bauer and Greg Ratham race the backhoe to save evidence of three centuries of urban life. No touched tombs will be found here. What the archaeologists are finding is the texture of our own yesterday. What I can remember, I'll tell you. I can tell you that I started to school up here in Somerville, up there by the cemetery. And in that cemetery, I have great uncles and cousins that I never seen, a grandfather that I never seen in that cemetery. My father worked in four different mines. My father worked in, in the Star Mine, he worked in Central. He worked in Somerset. Lottie Campbell Ramirez, born in 1894, is one of 4,000 people who once lived at the foot of California's Mount Diablo. Until the discovery here of cheap lignite coal in 1852, California depended for its energy on imports from England and South America. In the initial boom, miners, skilled and unskilled, arrived from Wales, Cornwall, Ireland, and the coal fields of Pennsylvania. They built five towns. Three railroads carried four million tons of coal down the hill to ships waiting at Pittsburgh and Antioch to take it 40 miles downriver to San Francisco and east to Sacramento and Stockton. The last coal mine closed in 1902. And when the mines died, so did the towns. Many miners moved to the northwest. Others moved their houses down to the port towns. Only the slag heaps remain in what is today Black Diamond Regional Park. That wood seems to be out of just a pocket, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But there is clearly something there that's not over here. Last spring, archaeology students from the University of California at Berkeley started the first season's dig at Summersville. They are led by archaeologist James Dietz. We're uh, digging here in Summersville because last fall, one of my students uh, for a class project did a study of the cemetery, and she came back in and said, look at this deep place. And I took a look and uh, asked a few questions and suddenly discovered that we had 
five communities up here which had utterly vanished from the face of the earth, which had at one time been uh, smoky, uh, dirty places full of people. And it struck me that it would be a marvelous place to uh, conduct some of the kind of historical archaeology that I think uh, we need so much of, to get some sense of, of what life was in fact like for uh, miners coming into this country working uh, 14 hours a day, uh, what the day-to-day -day life was like, uh, beyond what the records tell us. Sure, we know the men, and by the way, only the men then voted. We know that um, they paid their taxes, and we know what they built houses. We have photographs, but somehow there's a missing texture there, which archaeology can, in fact, provide. You look at the pictures, and you just... It must have been a, an amazing place. It must have been an awful place. I mean, these slag heaps smoking and great smokestacks rising up and tipples and we're digging the surface and you know in the winter and March it must have been slippery mud and the little kids wading through it from one house to another there's stuff tromped down into it that's the reality that comes through and when you work with this did men like working in the mines do you think that's all they had to do up there honey was work in the mines whether they liked it or not I think it's fair to say, and it's not original with me, that uh, both traditional American history and much of prehistoric archaeology tends to be, however unconsciously, elitist in orientation. Um, I tell my students, I think it's true, that the story of America, as it's been told, is a story of wealthy, white, middle-class males. And uh, that leaves out most of the people who have lived in this country for 350 years.